Welcome to Veritas Group's webinar Q&A with Jeff and Kara, everything you've ever wanted to ask about fundraising. Today's webinar features Jeff Schreifels, Principal at Veritas Group, and Kara Anasodi, Director of Client Services at Veritas Group. Together, they have decades of experience in fundraising and nonprofit leadership and have worked with hundreds of leaders and gift officers throughout the world. Welcome, Jeff and Kara. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and start with some of the questions that were submitted prior to today. Remember to pop those questions in that Q&A box to help me as we go along. So let's start with you, Jeff. As yeah. someone who has worked on several sides of revenue generation, relational fundraising, core, corps and foundations, direct response, how might relational fundraisers and direct response staff work together to more effectively foster a culture of philanthropy within the organization? This is from Holly Winter. Thank you, Holly. That's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, we've we've written about this for many, many years on how to bring these two disciplines together. And quite honestly, the simple answer is get them in a room together and start talking about their issues that they have. Um, help each other learn what each discipline is doing so that it creates empathy for each other's work. That's that's really the simple answer. Um, and then as a manager who's overseen all this and trying to make this happen, it's creating opportunities for these disciplines to come together in outside of the workplace, I think. You know, it's um, going to happy hour together. It's it's so it's it's a combination of bringing together during work uh, to learn about what each other is doing, sharing each other's plans, talking in real you know real time like what are you dealing with with donors so that you really get an understanding of each other's work, but then also outside of work. Now, one of the things we found that really helps bring them together a lot is a mid level program because you need both disciplines at the table to talk about how that's going to work. And so we have found over the years that creating that mid-level program for the first time in many cases, you get both of those disciplines around the table talking about, well, what does this mean for my revenue? You know, And how do you pass off donors? And you have to create protocols together as teams. And that really is, a catalyst to help bring those teams together. So Kara, I'm gonna ask you the second half, <clears throat> another question from Holly, it relates. Where do the opportunities for relational fundraising exist in typical direct response programs? Where might direct response principles augment and enhance basic relational fundraising outcomes? Yeah, we actually just did a really great webinar on this um, with um, some, some individuals that work with more group and I think Jeff nailed it in saying that, you know, this partnership is so incredibly critical in the growth. And there are a number of ways you can work with direct response. Um, I would say the two that really come to mind for me are utilize a direct response appeal to follow up with your donors or an impact report to follow up with your donors. It's a reason to call them. Did you receive it? How did that feel? How can I serve you, right? And then I think there's other opportunities to partner with direct response to say, hey, you guys have this great impact piece coming out. Can we you exclude mid-level and send it to us and let us send a note on it? Or can we do some um, variable print that looks like handwriting on those from us and I'll give you what that looks like? So there's some really good opportunities in there, I think, that really allow for you then to follow up and build that relationship and see how the donor's feeling uh, along the way. Yeah, that's a good point. Last week, actually, I was at a at a client of ours where they got the direct response team and support staff together to talk. And I got to speak with them about major gifts and what we're trying to achieve in major gifts and why they are so critically important to making major gifts successful. Mm -hmm. And so it was like one of the first times where they'd had that direct response discipline team at the table talking about major gifts. And it was great. We had this great conversation and they finally, you know, they understood like, what are these major gift officers? What do they even do every day? 
So I actually walked them through like the day in the life essentially of a major gift officer and why their work is so important to their work. And so that's another opportunity that you could provide for your team. What I love about that, Jeff, and what it, it, it really dovetails into how we talk about our program staff and stewarding them, it's a really good opportunity to steward your direct response partners, right? It's a good opportunity. You get a gift in because you've made this movement maybe from direct response to mid-level to major gifts. And you can reach out to them and say, because of our partnership, we grew this donor from $1,000 to $25,000 this year. We couldn't have done it without you. And so I think we have to remember along the way to bring those partners along and to let them know how they're positively impacting our work. Yeah. Yeah. You don't always think about it, but in this case, in this organization, and I know for other organizations, 80% of the major gift donors gave a first time $25 gift. Mm -hmm. So that when they heard that they were blown away, like, wow, you mean, so I get it now. Like the more you do acquisition, the better that you do that and cultivate these donors up the pipeline, the more of them will actually trickle into major gifts. And so that's why they were absolutely critical um, for that. So it was fun. Starting with you, Kara, <clears throat> I'm this is from Lauren. I'm working on building the major gifts pipeline at my foundation. The majority of donors give it a major gifts level to galas and did so because of their relationship with our two founders. They are still on our board, but not involved in the day to day, and we are no longer hosting galas. How do I re reconnect and build relationships with lapsed donors who don't have a personal connection to our mission? Yeah. So I have two thoughts on this, um, and, and I'll be interested to hear what Jeff's are. My first thought is, are those your only donors? Because just because they made a gift back then doesn't mean they're active now, right? And so do you have active donors that aren't being taken care of today? And do you have donors who are perhaps right below major gifts that you can cultivate to major gifts that actually do want to have a relationship with you and your organization? So I would I would really start there. Regarding those gala donors that have had that engagement and have had that connection in the past, um, I think there's a couple opportunities. One would be sending them an introduction letter and following our qualification process to see if they do have an interest in having a relationship with the organization, uh, perhaps using the board members today to help with that introduction process as needed. Um, but really utilizing that, like I said, that seven step process to see if they want to come along. And if they don't, that's okay, because you probably have donors who do want to come along and who do want to grow. And that's, that's that base right before major gifts you might want to be looking at. I agree. I think that is the, I think you take those donors and think of them separately as a, a donor pool, right? Mm -hmm. As you were talking about, create that, um, qualifying process, that seven to nine step process. And no, now in regular donors, we say one in three donors will say yes. So with an event donor, I would say it's probably more like one in five. Mm -hmm. So know that only one out of five of those donors are probably going to say, yes, I want a deeper relationship and I want to continue my, uh, my, uh, my giving to your organization. So go into it with that because it's really hard to bring a, an event donor into a mission donor. Um, and especially if they're lapsed, you know, that's even, that's another layer. So have the right expectations going into it. Thank you. I'm going to jump around on topics. So I think that way everybody gets a little bit of what they need today. Because I know we've got some and we've got some great questions coming in the Q&A box. Thank you all. Keep them coming. This one is confidential, anonymous. I know I'm not the only individual in the field that has received a performance improvement plan within my first six months at a small nonprofit. Tasked with creating the entire philanthropic strategy, metrics, reporting, et cetera, and funding with no donor base established <laughs> as we are a membership-based and sponsorship-heavy organization. Thoughts on how to raise above this and continue to build trust that a person like me was hired from my experience and expertise, if you will, within the field. Jeff, you want to start with that one? Ooh, this is a tough one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First of all, I feel for this person, and thanks for being vulnerable and talking about something that 
you know, it's not easy for fundraisers to talk about. I think you're in a really tough situation in that nonprofit. I think the expectation that you were supposed to just turn this thing around within a few months is absolutely ridiculous. And uh, if that is going to be the expectation, it doesn't matter how experienced you are in all of this. Uh, with leaders having that type of expectation, you're set up for failure because we all know that setting up a, <laughs> a, a fundraising program with no donors is going to take a long, it's a long game. I mean, we already know that even if you have donors and you're trying to build a major gift program, it takes a couple of years to do this. So, you know, one of the things that from this conference that I've heard over and over again is know when to get out. <laughs> and, and, you know, if you're in a situation where uh, the expectation is that within six months you would have had this turned around, even if it's within a year, you are you are going to fail in their eyes, even though you're not a failure. And unless you can convince leadership to change their idea of the time frame of this, um, it's you're going to be. I, I would say you need to find someplace else. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. Um, this is from Cheryl. I'll start with you, Kara. So Cheryl has a lot of background experience, director of philanthropy. She's now in a new position as head of stewardship, they're in a capital campaign. And her question is, what advice do you have for me in my new role on how I can best support our head of school who hasn't been directly involved in the capital campaign? And what are some of the best stewardship efforts and programs you've seen? I think probably one of the best things you could do is really sit down with that team and understand what their needs are gonna be from an impact perspective so that you can work with them to develop that, right? Um, I've sat in the stewardship world before. That's That's been my job. And um, I really looked at it in a, a few different ways. How, am, how are we going to really cultivate our major gift donors and what special things are we going to do for them, right? But then what can I do for the team as a large to ensure that our donors are thanked in an appropriate amount of time, to ensure that they understand the impact of the difference that their work is making and that they're really filling, we're filling their buckets in why they support our organization. And I think sitting down and building that annual plan for your team and having those resources available for them is one of the best gifts you can honestly give them. Thank you. Jeff, <clears throat> what experience or perspective does Veritas have on dual roles of a mid-level officer working or serving as a major gift officer with those who he, she has built a relationship? What is the primary reason benefit, if any, for MLO handing off a donor to an MGO? What does the MLO's relationship, if you've built that relationship, how do you hand that over and what does that look like? Okay, so there's two parts basically. One is, what do you think of an MGO, MLO kind of hybrid position? Well, we've worked with clients that have those um, positions and it takes a lot of discipline because uh, you're working kind of too different disciplines in a way in a, in a in in one sense in the major gift side you're you're really trying to connect build those deeper relationships and asking for larger gifts on mid level you're just starting to try to build some of those connections trying to find out what your donors passions and interests are making those kind of so depending on how you set up KPIs properly around all of that um you need to be very disciplined about your percentage of time that you're spending, how you're tiering things. So there needs to be a real set structure. And that's why a lot of folks reach out to us to help them do that, because that's what we do. We set up that structure. We're very adamant about how they do that. So if you're doing that on your own, you need, I would advocate that you have somebody else also keeping you accountable to how you're spending your time on that. But it is possible. Now, should this happen? How does this happen? Um, Kara, you can probably give more insight on that because you've worked on on the mid to major side a lot. But 
um, I think it's important because it is two different disciplines. You're dealing, mid-level is dealing with somewhere between five to 700 donors. Their goal is to move those tier A levels into major gifts where major gifts should have more time to spend on building the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mid-level, you're developing it, but in major gifts, you should have the time. That's why they have less donors to build those relationships. And that's why you want to move them. But Kara, maybe do you have some more insight on that? Yeah. So the mid, the mid-level major gift portfolio um, combination, I, I agree. It takes a strong discipline. What I see tends to happen is mid-level kind of gets ignored. I think there's some efficiencies you can build in there um, utilizing similar touch points, but um, it's possible. It's harder. Yeah. As far as the mid-level to major gift handoff, I hear you and I understand you. And I, um, whoever wrote this question, I, I've been there. It's hard to make that move, right? As a mid-level officer, I've thought to myself, I don't know if they're going to treat them as well as I do. I don't know if they're going to like really give them the love that I do. But you have to build those relationships with your colleagues and there has to be that trust there. That's why they're in their job. And it is our job to make those moves because that's the whole point of a mid-level program. Two to 3% at minimum need to be moving up every year. And I should say over, not up. Um, and the way I talk about doing that with our, with our clients is about serving the donor, right? I know that you have a passion for X and my colleague, Sarah, really is a subject matter expert in that area. She's local. She can visit you. She can spend more time with you. So you understand the difference your, your philanthropic dollars are making in it. And that allows us to make that move in a really thoughtful way. And I think as fundraisers, we have this mindset of like, ooh, it feels gross to the donor, but it doesn't. If we do it the right way and we're thoughtful about it and the donor knows we're doing it to serve them, it actually feels really wonderful. Thank you. That was from Randy Sharp. Great question, Randy. I'm getting a couple comments here and Kara, starting with you. What if I am a one person shop? I'm really small. Like, where do I start? What's important to focus on first? Yeah, I, it's, it's hard for me to say that without looking at the data and knowing where, you know, your data lives and um, what your numbers are. I would say if you have 450 donors that you can start with to qualify down to 150 for your major gifts portfolio, that's a great place to start. If you have a lot of um, mid-level donors and you have one person and you want to get 600 donors in a portfolio and really start building those relationships and you know you're going to be able to add additional staff in the future, that may be a, a great place to start as well. It It's kind of hard. Jeff, maybe you have a more direct answer, but it's hard to know without looking at the data and letting the data, we let the data drive our decisions, right? And where you really start for your organization. Yeah, I guess I would just add, mm -hmm. if you are a one person shop, it's, you have to figure out, depending on what the data tells you, what percent of your time are you gonna spend on major gifts? What percent of your time are you gonna do all the other development stuff? And then from there, so let's just say, all right, I can devote 10% of my time to major gifts. Well, what that means to us, and it should to you, <laughs> is that you can only successfully cultivate 15 major donors because a full portfolio of a full-time major gift officer is 150 donors. 10% of your time would be 15 donors. So that's one thing. And then from those 15, develop a plan that you <clears throat> have a structure built into because it's very important that you're able to do that. Otherwise, you'll be all over the place. And then just on a, you know, how to develop your day-to-day -day stuff, you, you've got to have a schedule that allows you to say, okay, this day I'm, you know, in my schedule, I'm devoting two hours to major gifts. This day I'm devoting towards acquisition and cultivating my, my regular file. This day I'm dealing with admin issues, you know, all of those kind of things. It's difficult, but it's possible. You just have to be realistic about what you can actually take on. Because when you're a one-person shop, you're, you're, you probably think you can do it all. 
but you can't. You can't do it all. You can't cultivate 50 donors or 100 donors on your own. Um, you may want to, but you will burn out and you will you you won't be happy. Great, thank you. We're hearing a, I'm seeing a lot of great comments here in the chat box about how this conversation is feeding people's souls and appreciating um, these great questions from you all. So thank you, Jeff. I'm just gonna we'll come back to some mid level questions here in a minute. Let's let's pop over to something else. How important is an organizational case statement for major donors? How is it best developed and used by an NGO? Well, first of all, just outside of that one case statement, I would say having offers that you can take and inspire your donors with is really important and having multiple offers. So at Veritas, we go through a whole process called the donor impact portfolio, where we take the entire organization's budget and package it into all the programs and projects that they have and, and understanding how much it actually costs and then how much they have to left over raise for each of those projects. From that information, we turn them into case statements that can be used in multi different media, either on paper, on PowerPoints, on you know any type of media, because that is what you need for your major gift officer to empower them to inspire their donors. And you know, donors want to know the full story about what is it that they're actually funding outside of you just telling them, hey, we need money for this children's program. Well, I need a little bit more than that. <laughs> and that's where a great case statement comes in. Um, but the but I see also on the other side where major gift officers rely so heavily on a case statement, they feel like they can't do anything without it. You know, so there's that tension between being able to develop the relationship with a donor, making a solicitation, and then having the perfect case statement to go with it. What you really need is to make sure you at least have a plethora of offers and you know how much they cost so that you can actually go out to a donor and um, intelligently tell them what you need. Um, and the case statement enhances everything. So it's like you're talking and then you're leaving behind this case statement that reinforces everything you're telling the donor. So it's important, but it's not the thing that's going to make them say yes, in a, in a sense. Kara, do you have anything to add to that? No, I just, I, I, I see time and time again where, you know, I'll have a client say, yeah, I have a donor who said, if we need anything, you know, if there's anything that pops up, <laughs> financially um, to let them know, and they don't have those donor offers. And so they don't have insight into the budget or what those needs are to be able to go back to them to say, actually, you know what? We have a gap of about $25,000 this year, 10 here and 15 here. Does anything in there resonate with you? Because we really would love your support in helping close that gap. That's what a donor offer can do for a donor and an organization that is really important that I don't think enough people really um, are able to do yet. Yeah. So we have a number of questions here about sort of the structure and system of the mid-level program, Kara. And then how do we use surveys to, you know, really reach out to people you haven't you haven't had conversations with? So talk mm -hmm. about sort of how many touch points and how does that work and how how do we best use a survey in that process? Yeah. So can you help me understand, Karen, you mentioned structure of mid-level. What is it? What what part of that are, is the question really bubbling up on? Yeah, there's there's a number. Of, I'm kind of combining some questions. So sure. some of them are like, we do three touch points a year. Is that enough? Some of them are Got around, um, how do we use a survey? Got it. Uh, how, how do we set this up for success? Mm -hmm. Great questions. Um, so typically we at Veritas will build a mid-level communication calendar um, for our mid-level programs, and they span the first 12 months uh, of the program. The first year is really what we initially start with. And there's usually about six to eight touch points in there. We look at touching donors every 45 to 60 days in the mid-level program. A survey is a wonderful tool if you're not able to have established a relationship with the donor yet. So we look at an introduction process that's usually a letter or email. We do some follow-up to that, uh, depending on their tier. 
We go into an impact-based statement, again, trying to still build that relationship and let them know the value we add as mid-level officers. And then we go into that survey. What I wanna be clear on with a survey is that it's really informational questions. Surveys can um, turn people and donors off, right? And so we usually talk to our donors about them and our clients about them as informational questions so that we can better serve them. So it's usually five questions. How can we better serve you? What's inspired your support? What part of our work really resonates with you? Questions like that. So we can learn passions and interests and we can build relationships. We like um, to be communicated with. How do you like to be communicated with? You know, one we've talked about recently that not everybody's including that we really should be thinking about is, are you thinking about, have you put us in your estate plans? Is that something that you're thinking about? Because again, that's another area that allows us to build a relationship. And so Karen, that's when we think about communicating to the, our donors, that's really what we're looking at with those that first year being probably six to eight touch points. And then a, a annually, um, probably closer to eight. We alternate between email, mail, and phone, unless a donor tells us how they specifically want to be communicated with. And then that's how we communicate with them. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a difficult system, but it's a system, right? And that allows us to ensure that we're touching everyone in a really thoughtful way, uh, in a one-to-some capacity, because it can be hard to reach 600 donors at a time. I think I would add is that that six to eight touch points is on top of Thank what you. you're doing in the direct response program. So That's in other right. words, do not take them out of your direct response communication plan. They have been getting that. So if they reach mid-level, it doesn't mean you take them out, leave them in. And within that direct response plan, there might be some different type of packaging that you're doing, but I would strongly suggest leaving them in the quant, the frequency, everything else, and using the six to eight as an addition that's coming from a rep because yeah. they're introduced to more personalized communication. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Jeff. Um, Mid-level is an overlay to direct response, right? That's what we tell everyone. But again, let's go back to one of those first questions. How do you partner with direct response? Well, one of those touch points might be a follow-up to a solicitation direct response sent. Again, we're still an overlay, but we're partnering with them along the way to utilize resources in, in both teams. Exactly. So we have a question here from the Foundation for Fighting Blindness, excuse me, and you've answered their first question about how many how many donors can be managed. They also asked, should the mid-level program inc include our sustainers who are giving a thousand per year on a monthly basis? And then two, our direct mail program has about 30,000 donors right now. Some of those donors have a net worth capacity of a million or more. What metrics should we use to potentially begin cultivating those donors to try to upgrade to the mid-level program? Jeff, start with that. Okay, so I would, uh, yeah, if you have knowledge of those million dollar plus donors of your 30,000, take them, not, don't take them out of your direct mail, mail stream or anything, but I would look at trying to separately um, use some direct response strategies to get them to give higher <laughs> gifts. And there's all kinds of tactics with your direct response team that they should be utilizing to get them to start moving their gifts up so that they're that they're starting to give in that level. The other thing that I would do is start reaching out to them in a sense qualifying them to see if they actually are a 1 million type of donor, do they have propensity, finding out more information about them because just because they may have capacity or we think they have capacity, doesn't mean that they do. And so what you don't want to do is take those million-dollar capacity donors and now go, oh, they should be in a mid-level program, or they should be in a major gift program. That would be the wrong thing to do because we don't know that yet. The idea is to try to find that out. And so you can do that a couple of ways. You can do it through surveys. You can do it through reaching out to them and talking to them. And you can do it by trying to change their gift ask arrays and move them up and see if they would give a gift that would qualify, qualify them as a mid or a major donor. So I have two things I'd like to add to that. One, the sustainer question. 
emphatically, yes. Sustainers are some of your best and most important donors. They are making a monthly gift and you have their credit card on file. Cultivate them and steward the heck out of them and absolutely put them in mid-level. You want to build that relationship with them and you want to grow them. I, I feel strongly about that one, if you guys couldn't tell. Um, <laughs> two, uh, another thought or I, I, one thing I've seen that really works with mid-level so you have your mid-level portfolio, and, and again, of around 600, depending on, um, depending on other responsibilities. I like to look at the group of donors just before mid-level as well. And you could think about this from those high-capacity donors. And when those donors make a gift, so I'm going to give an example. $1,000 is your mid-level start, starting point. All your 500-plus donors, if you have enough staff to do this, in addition to their mid-level job, they call and thank any 500 plus gift, or they send a handwritten note, depending on that donor email. What you're going to see very quickly is an upgrade from those donors, a second gift, because they've had, they've had that stewardship. And so that's another way to think about it is what responsibility can mid-level help in growing their pipeline? We did this with one organization and uh, in the first year it was two and a half people and they upgraded 111 of those donors right before mid-level to mid-level portfolio. And then they kept with that same mid-level officer because they were able to track that metric, um, which is to me, a wonderful pipeline. Yeah. Fantastic. Let's move to major gifts for a minute here, Jeff. This is anonymous. And this has to do with, think about our, our qualifying process and how that's different in major gifts and mid-level. This may be piggybacking on a previous question, but what is your advice on connecting with major donors who give generously every year, but have not been responsive to our outreach? They are receiving our materials, touch points, continue to give, but no response. So a couple of things is I would continue to be, try to be persistent in a good way and trying to reach out to them. But also the other side of it is, is you will have some donors that just don't want a relationship. So I don't know if you've qualified that person, but we see this often in, in donor files where someone will just give you know, $5,000 every November or whatever. And they're just, and someone puts them on a portfolio because <laughs> it, you know, they're, they're guaranteed that they're gonna give that $5,000, but they haven't actually been qualified in, in the sense that do they want a personal relationship with someone? from your organization. And if you're continually trying to reach out and if you, and now that's a, another thing. A lot of folks think, well, I tried three times and then they never responded. Seven to nine tries. So that could take you almost a full year of trying to reach out to that donor. But let's just say you've done that and they still haven't. That's telling you they don't want that relationship. That's okay. Now you know what that donor wants and doesn't want. Um, you know, keep them on your radar, but I wouldn't put them in a portfolio and I wouldn't, you know, um, try to keep reaching out after you've done all of those touch points. And I just want to clear up one thing because I think Karen, you asked a question a minute ago that that raised this in my brain, which was. You qualify, I want to clarify, you qualify major gift donors. That means you've had a two-way connection with them. They have identified that they want to have a relationship with you. They've returned a survey. They've picked up the phone. They've responded to your email, whatever that can be, right? Mid-level, we consider mid-level qualified, right? You have to opt into major gifts. Yes, I want a relationship. You have to opt out of mid-level. You know what? I really don't want any personal touch. That being said, when we make those moves from mid-level to major gifts, we like those donors to have had a two-way connection with the mid-level officer because we know then it's the right move to make to major gifts because they want that relationship. Yeah. That way the major gift officer doesn't have to qualify the donor. That's right. That's which right. is why major gift loves mid-level. <laughs> so on that topic, <laughs> Jeff, keep going. What metrics help determine when to move someone up from mid-level to major gifts? Well, I mean, typically, whatever your major gift level is. So let's just say your major gift level is in, I'm just going to make this up, at 10,000 plus QM. 
So your donor has reached that level, that would be the time that you would introduce them over. But there could be other things, and Kara, you might want to be might want to chime in on this, but it could be a conversation that you have with a donor. Say they're not yet giving at the major donor, but they've just indicated that they have a DAF or they have a family foundation or something like that, that you may then go, you know what, maybe a conversation with our major gift officer is appropriate at this time. So that would be an indicator. Similar question, like what if what if I'm a low mid-level donor set says they have a 500k bequest? Do I then pass them on? Do I keep them? What do we what do we do with them, Kara? You're making a good facial expression. Well, they're a wonderful donor, and hopefully you have a plan giving officer that you can work with that can work with that donor on that. But our goal is to continue those annual mid-level or major gift gifts from that donor as well. So that really, to me, goes back to partnership. And you want to be able to partner, partner with your plan giving team to ensure that it's a yes and, it's not an either or. Great. Um, Jeff, speak to, can you share examples of a successful giving society, including levels, benefits, and how long to implement one? What do we talk <laughs> about? When we talk, what do we say when we talk about giving societies? Well, <laughs> I'm an advocate for plan giving society. I'm not so big on, I, I'm anti actually giving societies that has different membership levels or different incentives to get a person to give from, oh, at the thousand to $5,000 level, you are now, you're, you're going from silver to platinum if you give this gift or whatever the name is. And the reason I'm against that is because it's transactional in nature. You're not getting the donor to give for a project, for, a, for the mission. It's more to get to a next level of things and benefits. Now, I do like the idea of having affinity groups where you're getting donors together who might um, have a particular interest in part of your mission that you have. So for example, let's say uh, if you're serving the homeless, there's some donors that are really big in um, feeding program that you have. Well, you have a number of donors that are interested in that, bringing them together in a sense of, hey, I want to give you a report together as a, as, a, as a group of donors that love this. Here's what's happening. Because people like to be part of groups um, like themselves, and that's an incentive for them to continue their giving. So that's a little different than a giving club. Giving clubs, no. Affinity groups, if done well, I fully support. There's a comment. No to giving societies. <laughs> they can be a they can be a tool and a touch point. But yes, thank you, Jeff. This is an interesting question, Kara. Let's start with you. We've been this has been a good, great conversation we're having here at this um, African American Leadership Conference on fundraising with Ch with Case. I'm curious what the panelists would say about fundraising for strategies that support a region's nonprofit sector versus direct support for a single neighborhood or community. I'm developing a solution to provide, you know, basically, how do you make impact for food in a region? So it can be difficult to have a discussion for charities unused to the idea of mutual support and multi-stakeholder initiatives. So as we think about being more community-based and making sure resources go to a variety of nonprofits in the community, how do we talk to donors about that? What would that look like and sound like? Jeff, I'm going to... I'm going to pitch this one over to you. I mean, that's a tough question because I think we we have to go back to filling our donors' buckets, right? And their passions and interests. And so I'll, I'll, I'll see what Jeff says. You have to put it out there. Some donors will embrace that. I mean, look at like um, Feeding America. I mean, they're raising money from people that are dealing with hunger across Amer the country. And then within their network, they're also raising money locally. And I know for a fact that they have donors that give to both the national and the local or regional 
that they're a part of. So it's just a matter of finding those donors that actually want, that resonate with that type of offer. And you will, uh, you know, find those donors. So I put it out there, but some of them won't. You can't convince somebody that's really just focused in on Louisville, perhaps to care about what's going on in Washington state. But there are donors that do. Thank you. Um, this is an interesting one. We, we can talk about sort of other examples of this. We recently received a casual offer from our current governor to help us fundraise. Given political divides, do we have you have any ideas of the top, off the top of your head to take advantage of this offer while not alienated particular donors? Anybody want to take that one? That's an interesting wow, one. That's interesting. <clears throat> it depends on what the the mission of the organization is, if it's political or not. And the so, you know, if it were, um, let's just say, a like a like a feeding america program like a food bank i think having the support of your governor to support the food bank would be fine would be great um because it's community based and so technically that's the governor is worried about his state community so it's very tricky but if it was some other offer uh that could alienate half of your donor base <laughs> Um, that might be tricky and it'd be probably also depends on, uh, how bipartisan, uh, your governor is as far as like what people see and feel, right. Uh, if you have a, a governor who's affiliated very strongly one way or the other, to your point, Jeff, that really could be a, um, could alienate a large group of people. Yeah. Thank you. Great question, Alina. Um, this is from Cindy. <clears throat> Kara, we'll start with you. We're asking board members to host small gatherings and to invite friends, business associates, et cetera, to learn about our mission and current funding priorities. Do you recommend this to be a strictly non-ask event? Our CEO is concerned that some of these new potential donor partners will be difficult to follow up with if we wait to ask for their support. He's concerned this will be a missed opportunity for us. Mm. Um, I'll... I struggle with that one and making an ask directly at that point in time, because you really haven't learned who those people are and or what their love and passion for your organization is. So rather than saying I'd make an ask right then and there, <clears throat> I would probably focus on finding ways to ensure that you have way follow up opportunities with the individuals who actually attend so that you can then really be more relationship based in your approach than transactional based from the event. Yeah, I love the strategy I heard from someone on one of our live calls. They had someone on that event, in that event meeting, taking notes of what people were saying so you could follow up and be really specific, like, oh, I heard you mention this or heard you ask a question about that. So they really feel seen and heard um, from the event experience. And we have to believe that there's going to be someone there's inviting them. They have their contact information, right? And if you're inviting them and you're not following up with allowing us to follow up with them, what's what's the point, right? So there, I, I just feel like I would I would really focus on the relationship side of those events. Jeff, um, what would what and how would you suggest an opportunity to grow donor base and giving towards a centennial year? or maybe it's a capital campaign, or it's like a big event. How do, let's talk about how those could be a part of relational major gifts. How to grow the donor base? How would you suggest an opportunity to grow don a donor base, yeah. I'm wondering if that's in number or in financials, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So I always look at, those kind of things like a centennial or a capital campaign as another offer to bring to donors to help them to increase their giving potentially. Um, I would be suspicious of trying to raise money for a centennial because that's all about you. Unless under the guise of the centennial, you're doing X, Y, and Z that's adding to your mission. So in other words, donors aren't really motivated just because now you're 100 years old. 
That sounds great internally. Hey, we're 100 years old. Let's raise money off of that. That's not a great offer. A great offer would be we're 100 years old and we've done all this and it's launching this X, Y, Z. We want you to get on board with that because that's exciting, whatever that is. Um, and just like a capital campaign, some of your donors will get into that and some others won't. Um, and the capital campaign to me is another enhanced offer. Like if, during this capital campaign, we're going to do X, Y, and Z more of. Um, do you want to be a part of that? Um, and in addition to what you're already doing, here's something else that we have for you that knowing you, I think you might be interested in. Yeah, I've I've seen organizations make the mistake of saying, yeah, there's an emergency, but we're our team isn't really going to send them anything about that emergency because we have a capital campaign coming up. Yeah. No, please don't yeah. do that, right? Because you have emergency donors who want to give to that and you have donors who want to give to a capital campaign. It 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 doesn't have to be an either or. We have to follow the values and the passions of our donors not our own intrinsic right interests. I have so many great questions here. We could be here for three hours. You all are- <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, crazy. I don't have to choose one question. Try to just change some topics. We can try to hit something that will help everyone. So this is an interesting one, Kara, I'll start with you. And we'll do a couple on just donor calls, right? So any advice on moving forward after an awkward donor call? For example, when you call to say thank you or introduce yourself and the conversation is short and dry or weird or awkward. What's a good next step? Well, I think it depends. <clears throat> I think it depends on the setup to that call. Was it a cold call and they weren't expecting you? Well, then we we can kind of assume that could happen, right? Um, we like when we do qualification or introductions for donors, new donors, we like to send them an introduction letter, a qualification letter to say, you know what, I'm here's who I am. Here's some of my passions and interests and in why I do this work. I'm going to be calling you to follow up with you to see what your passions and interests are. This is not going to be a call for solicitation. I really just want to learn who you are. It softens them up so that we don't have those weird cult, those weird calls. They still happen, right? But I think it's an opportunity to say, why did this happen? Did we not introduce ourselves in the right way? And how can I build on this? So I'm going to spend the next two months sending them each month an impact statement about the difference they've made. A, you made a difference piece. And then I'm going to follow up with them again and see how that felt to them. And maybe I'm going to try a different version of follow-up. I'm going to I'm going to send them an email because maybe they were just busy and find out what works better for them. And use permission-based asking along the way. You know, I it, it sounds like you might be busy. Is now not a good time? Would you prefer I follow up with you on email? So I think there's a number of things. We get in the way of ourselves. We tell ourselves a story. They don't want to talk to us because they um, they don't they don't like me. It's not personal. Things happen. People have lives, right? And we have to stop telling ourselves that story and really ask the questions that the donor and continue putting ourselves in a position where we can let them know the difference that they're making in order to build that relationship. So to continue down that path, Kara, um, Aaron says she's a new mid-level officer and they're in the middle of a match campaign. So she hasn't had the opportunity to build that relationship with the donors, but they're but being asked to make an ask on that first call. Mm. What would mm. you recommend that mid-level officer do? I don't, Jeff, you tell me if you disagree. I don't ever like a mid-level officer making an ask on the first call. You have just set yourself up for failure, in my opinion. Um, you need to build the relationship. That's what your direct response program should be for, right? That can go out digitally, that can go out via mail and you can follow up and talk to them and build a relationship with them. But I think making an ask in the very beginning of your introduction process um, can really push your donors away. Agreed. Jeff, do you disagree? Okay. I agree. Yeah, if it's your first contact, that's so tough. Mm. Like let, let a, a telemarketing company do that. Seriously, let that that's for that kind of a situation. This is you're trying to build trust with the, with the donor. If you're immediately going out with an ask, you might get some gifts, but you could be alienating so many of your donors because of that. And you'll they'll 
be hesitant to pick up your call in the future. Yeah, we work we work with a very large international national organization that hired new MLOs right at the holidays. Great time to be asking, and she had them not do any asking. Mm-mm. So they built those relationships. I love it. Mm-hmm. A lot of great, like, oh my gosh, you're validating my intuition. So thank you for that answer. And oh, can I add one more thing to that, mm-hmm. Karen? Instead, use that match as an opportunity to thank them and introduce yourself. That is a very different conversation, and that builds a very different level of trust. What do you mean by that exactly? What's well, that you, the introduction process at year end is really what triggered that thought for me. Um, when I have teams starting their introduction process at year end, depending on how close to year end we are, I usually let them start it once a donor has made their year end gift, if that's the time of year they give. So if this donor gives in in November and we're launching in November, let's hold off and see if they make that gift and then let's call them and thank them for that gift, introduce ourselves, send them, let them know we're sending a letter or email so that they have our contact information it just builds a different level of trust. A question here, we'll start with you, Kara, again, because I know you work with people all the time Mm -hmm. in this very conversation, anonymous. How do you get over the fear of the ask? I'm newer to the the industry and still can't shake it. Well, even though you're, there's people who've been here a while that still can't shake it. So give some good advice there, Kara. You know, I don't think the ask has to be scary. And I think about the ask from a number of different, Uh, not just the financial ask, but the ask for an opportunity for a meeting or the ask for learning more about passions and interests. And what I love about the work that we do is our permission-based asking model because it allows the donor to give you permission to go to the next level to make whether whatever kind of ask that is. So Jeff, it's really great seeing you today. I'm so grateful you've taken the time to talk with me. I know we have about 10 minutes that we talked about having, would it be okay if we jumped right into um, our conversation? Would you, would you mind sharing a little bit about your love for our organization? And all of a sudden you're building trust along the the way of that permission-based asking, and they're giving you permission to make that ask. And so I recommend practice that with someone, right? Have those conversations. We tell our clients like, practice it on your teenager, practice it on your husband, right? If you want to ask a difficult question. And I eventually it becomes part of who you are and how you work with people. And I really think it takes that fear away. Donors want to be asked for money. Don't forget that. They, if they are meeting with you, they're expecting you eventually to ask for money and they want you to because they want to make a difference in your mission. So keep that top of mind all the time. Exactly. This is an anonymous one. It says, sorry, this is a downer. No, do not apologize for this. My current organization is my favorite donor is my favorite donor portfolio and I love the program staff. Unfortunately, development management is a checklist of what I what not to do straight from your blog. The leadership isn't listening. I'm doing my best fundraising work, but internally set up to fail. I know I need to leave, but how do I leave with grace and do right by my donors? Is it worth giving feedback if it will fall on deaf ears? Great question. Sounds Great like you, it sounds like you've made that decision. So, um, Leaving with grace, that's a great question. I think if you've done all you can with your donors and your organization, you do, you know, you give the organization enough time. It's not like you're leaving like immediately. So give them some space if you can, to, because they will have to hire someone without in place of you. Um, and then with donors, um, I think you just say you're moving on. Um, and that you've had a great, you, you've had a, a great time getting to know them. Hopefully that they will continue supporting the mission. It's all about the organization at this point. It's not about you. It's, you know, you don't, you don't want to do anything crazy, like saying, oh, I'm going over here. I think you might be interested in that too. Do not do that. And I don't think you sound like the kind of person that would do that. So um, I think it's always bringing the donor back to thanking them for supporting this mission and how amazing it is and and ask them to continue supporting it and that they'll support the new person coming in, taking their place. And if it's possible to move, even introduce the new person to them, that would even the best. 
if you had that overlap. Sometimes, obviously, you don't. But if you did, that would be a great thing to do is be able to introduce the next person um, to, to that donor. Yes. Thank you for that, that beauty around leaving with grace. All right. We're, we have already used up an hour here. So let's close out with just some final words of wisdom, whatever burning thing you'd love to share um, as we close out this great conversation. We, we are collecting these, your questions, even if it didn't get asked today, will probably be seen in one of Jeff's future or my future blogs. <laughs> we really love to hear what's Sarah. on your mind and what you're curious about. So I apologize if we didn't get to your question. It is still very important to us to hear what those are. So starting with you, Jeff. Gosh, no you pressure. Know, yeah, um, I'll just say something personal. What I'm learning from this conference. So obviously, as a white middle-aged male, I'm in the vast minority here, and it's really been good. It's another good reminder to one: if you're white, to put yourself into those kind of positions if you can because it helps you understand what people of color are going through in our development industry. Um, it is another level of, it's a barrier, another level that people of color have to go through on a daily basis that us being white don't understand because we, we walk in a white world. And so we don't see our own privilege. And so um, I just encourage you, if you're white, to put yourself in those positions and because it creates empathy and understanding of what our people of color colleagues are have to go through uh, in our work. Thank you, Jen. And I would just say fundraising is hard. And one of the greatest things that Jeff always tells us as coaches and leaders with organizations is if you are building a plan for every single one of your donors and you are working that plan, you're doing everything you can do. And the economy can have its challenges and you can see that in the finances of your portfolio. But if you're building your plan and working your plan, those donors will continue to support you they will come back and you're doing everything you possibly can. And we just have to remember that. Yeah. It's a hard, it's a hard industry. Thank you, yeah, Kara. That's a good last words. And thank you all for being with us today and for sharing your great questions. As a reminder, you'll receive a recording of this webinar later today. And as always, we're available to assist you with any questions by email at hello at veritasgroup.com. Everyone take care. <laughs>